Days Gone is one of the most confusing games I have ever played. Not confusing in its gameplay or story, but in the fact that it's way better than it seems. In other words, if I had to briefly explain my feelings towards Days Gone, I'd say that it's the worst, best game I've played in a long time. And this may seem needlessly vague and confusing, but it's honestly representative of how I feel. So much of this game is great but it has a huge presentation problem. It's like a supermodel walking down the runway, but she keeps tripping and ruining what would otherwise be a fantastic presentation. All of that being said, I think Days Gone is worth a playthrough, with several caveats, of course. I played through the game on a PS4 Slim and a God of War edition of the PS4 Pro. The game ran significantly better on the Pro, so much so that switching back to the Slim was actually quite jarring. Now please understand that the technical issues in Days Gone are omnipresent and won't go away just because you have a pro, but they are reduced. And if you're wondering what kind of technical issues I'm talking about, don't worry. I'm going to go in depth on those issues towards the end of the video. But to avoid spoilers, I'll just say this. Days Gone is a blast, but limps along its excessive main quest line without much focus or determination. The average person's 40 hour run is well worth it just for the last 10 or so hours, but be warned, if you have trouble ignoring or adapting to frame drops and glitches in general, you'll likely become overly frustrated with the game before you even get there. Honestly, if the game were polished, it would be in the running for my game of the year, but the simple reality is that it isn't. People come to my videos to see if a game is worth playing and to hear honestly what its value, strengths, and weaknesses are. I have a duty to be honest. My instinct is to take the path more traveled and to just recommend the game because I enjoyed it and call it a day, but I'd be doing you a disservice were I to do that. All of this is because after two runs and over 80 hours of gameplay, I can safely say that Days Gone should have been about half of the length that it is. According to HowLongToBeat.com, most runs are around 35 and a half hours. And having gone through it twice and putting a lot of thought into it, I can safely say that if the game were cut in half and more polish put in place of the extra development time, the game would be significantly better. But don't worry, I'm going to explain exactly what I would change in the game and how these cuts would work later in this video. But allow me to discuss for a moment what polish actually means. A lot of people say that a game like Days Gone needs more polish, but they never go into what that exactly entails, as if it's just some sort of term that is all-encompassing in terms of improving the quality of a product. In this case, what I mean is that there's a diamond in the middle of all of this rough but it's pretty deep down. There is a diamond hidden in this game. It's just under a ton of bugs and glitches that make it very difficult to consume and remember all of the good parts. Think of a game like a road. Some potholes are to be expected. After all, no road is perfectly smooth, but potholes are on a spectrum. Some are small and hardly noticed, others are large enough to be a slight annoyance but nothing more, and a small few are so massive that they'll pop your tire and stop your car entirely. And this is what Days Gone's tech issues are like. But don't worry, we'll go into a lot of detail with these issues later in the video. All that being said, there's a lot of love in this game. It's just terrible at presenting itself. Partially glitches, also pacing and scope, but mostly it has to do with the game's identity. Honestly, it, it just doesn't know what it wants to be, which is why it wanders so much and why the story feels completely different in the last 10 hours compared to the first 10. It's also why the consequences in the world feel so inconsistent, because one minute Deacon is getting freaked out by shooting someone in the head to survive, and the next he's using a baseball bat with pieces of transmission attached to it to hunt zombie toddlers. As for the question of price, that's one of the more difficult questions to answer. On the one hand, the game is very large, and you can tell that a lot of work and passion went into it, and in that regard I can understand the desire to support the artists who made it possible. However, if you're on a stricter budget, understand that Days Gone is simply nowhere near most other AAA games in terms of polish, and that's saying something. When you look at other games you can get for $60, we look at games such as Red Dead Redemption 2, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, and God of War, all massive games that are highly polished. And maybe I'm wrong for not being able to separate these things in my mind, but to me, if you're going to ask for $60, it's fair to expect $60 quality. I don't know though, let me know if I'm wrong about this. 
I guess my point is just that $60 is too much for the game in its current state. If you can get it on sale for $40 or below, I would recommend it. I enjoyed my time with Days Gone, but there are a lot of problems with it. And that's what this video is going to be about. We're mostly going to be breaking down the things that the game doesn't do well in an attempt to wade through the aforementioned rough and find the diamond underneath. It will probably seem like I'm being excessively negative, but bear in mind that at the end of the day, I still recommend the game, and I do enjoy it. I just owe you all an honest breakdown of what the game does well and what it does poorly. But that does it for the pre-spoiler warning part of the video. If you are on the fence about the game, I'd say go for it, especially if you can get it on sale. But from here on out, we're going to be breaking down the game in detail, including many of the late game sections and missions. Consider yourself warned. From now on, I'll assume that you will have played the game all the way through, and so I won't waste your time by explaining every little thing that happens. I honestly don't know where to start with this video. Glitches are a huge factor and should be discussed, but I don't want to make that the defining factor of the game, so I'll discuss them towards the end of the video instead. And of course, I'll have timestamps in the description box below so that you can wade through the video however you want to. But first, let's focus on the core game while ignoring the technical issues as best we can. Specifically, Let's look at the narrative. The game is actually quite simple. You're playing as a character named Deacon St. John. The world is infested with freakers, not zombies, who travel in massive hordes and kill any person that they come into contact with. All major governments have collapsed, except for a few branches of the Fed, which run the group called Nero who you follow throughout the game to gain information from covertly, seeing as how they will kill you on sight if they see you so as to not risk infection. And this is, so far, so good. It's a typical zombie storyline, or I guess freaker storyline. And this stays at about this level throughout the whole story, but where it diverges from typical zombie storylines is in its use of factions, which I really liked. There are four main groups that you'll work with throughout the campaign. Each of them have a camp and are represented usually by one person who is their leader. In this case, we have Copeland, Tucker, Iron Mike, and the Militia, who's headed up by a man who's known as the Colonel or Colonel Garrett. The Colonel is by far the most interesting character out of these four. He's a crazed, Bible-thumping lunatic who's convinced that the end of the world is upon them, which is honestly fair. But furthermore, he believes that the only way for him and his followers to survive this post-apocalyptic world is to lock themselves into a mountain fortress that he calls the Ark. But don't worry, we'll talk more about each of these in just a little bit. But first, more about Deacon. Deacon was married to a woman named Sarah, who was injured right as the virus broke out. In one of the first cutscenes that we see, we see Sarah being evacuated out of the area while leaving Deacon and Boozer, who's a friend who's like a brother to Deacon and Sarah, behind. A couple of years go by, and at this point we find out that Deacon believes that Sarah is dead and that he's alone with Boozer in this post-apocalyptic world. As far as he knows, Sarah was taken to a camp that was eventually overrun by all of these freakers and she no doubt died when the camp was overrun. Because of this, he behaves highly erratically, and multiple times, characters ask him if he has a death wish, because he totally does. At this early point in the story, he doesn't really have a reason for living other than Boozer, which is why the next plot point is so important. Early in the game, Boozer's arm gets burnt by some crazy people known as the Rippers who will become important later in the story, and eventually, his arm grows infected. Deacon tries to take care of Boozer, but it steadily gets worse to the point where Deacon needs to look elsewhere for help in taking care of Boozer before the infection kills him. All of this forces Deacon to look at himself to determine whether or not he'd like to live with literally no one, whether or not this big, empty, and unforgiving world is worth living through. And I really liked this plot point. While Boozer is teetering on the edge of death, Deacon is forced to reevaluate whether or not life is worth living, and that's something that's very important to understand about yourself in a post-apocalyptic situation such as this. Why are you even trying? Everything is terrible, all the people you love are gone, what's the point of living? And like I said, this was really cool, and I thought that this was going to be one of the major plot points of the entire game, is Deacon trying to reckon this terrible world with his quite awful standing within it. But unfortunately, the game never really allows this to mature and bake because of what I consider to be the worst mistake that the game's narrative commits. 
Deacon eventually finds out that O'Brien, the Nero agent who helped save Sarah in the beginning, is still alive. And he's now a higher up in Nero, and that he potentially has information about Sarah. Deacon reaches out to O'Brien and contacts him, and they start working together to find Sarah because, according to O'Brien, she may still be alive. And let me make this very clear. I hate this. The whole game, I'm performing menial tasks for uninteresting characters such as Tucker and Copeland just to log enough game time to unlock the next O'Brien mission where he inevitably tells me that he's still working on it. This goes on for a solid 20 hours of gameplay. And I get it, Deacon is still hoping that Sarah is alive. Any person who loves their wife who disappears mysteriously would still hope for her to be alive, but motivating the player and gameplay loop purely by means of uncertainty and hope and delusion that something might happen to me isn't clever, it's just uninspired and underwhelming. However, I fully understand that this is a personal preference and that others may have really enjoyed playing for 20 hours only occasionally receiving info on Sarah's possible survival, but that's not my only issue with it. I'm very cynical. I love La La Land, if that tells you anything. I like it when a story has consequences, when a character messes up and things don't just coincidentally work out. I like it because it's true to how life actually works, but I completely understand why others might hate this, because they want their entertainment to be an escape from reality, not a return or reminder of it. It's like Kahlua. I can't stand this stuff. It makes me dry heave just to smell it. But that doesn't mean that other people are wrong to enjoy it. It's just a difference of opinion and taste and gag reflex. But with all that being said, Sarah's story seems to me to be a complete waste of time during this first act and a half of the game. All of this, in addition to the fact that Sarah's survival through these last two years are purely a result of coincidence, which I'll discuss more in a moment. Furthermore, this drip 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 of info requires Deacon to be temporarily stupid and ignore the obvious, something else that I hate in narratives. The only reason that she survived the initial helicopter ride was because it was diverted to another camp, but this one was also overrun. Oh no! But actually, it's okay, because they evacuated her before it was too late, because before the catastrophe, she had a certain rank within a government lab. Now. To the player, this seems obvious, but Deacon doesn't remember that she was working for a government lab until two-thirds of the way through the story. Now, once he realizes that Sarah held this position within the government lab and that she was working for the government, period, Deacon realizes that she would likely have been evacuated before everybody else, in other words, given priority evacuation, which means that she likely survived at least this next camp being overrun. Had he remembered this, Deacon likely would have searched a lot harder for Sarah because he would know that she was likely removed before the aforementioned camps were overrun. All of this is just lazy. She's not resourceful, she's just lucky. If luck is what it takes to survive in this world that they've built, why try so hard? Now, some people might say that this is a meta commentary on the nature of life and how everything is dictated by chance and its order arising out of chaos through nothing but happenstance. But to me, the simpler and more likely explanation is that it's just lazy writing relying on a deus ex machina in order to explain things. To me, it seems that Occam's Razor would dictate that lazy writing explains all of this much easier than a masterful implementation of a meta commentary on the nature of existence. But again, you tell me. Now, despite all of this, Deacon slowly learns to deal with Sarah's death and accept it, and that's one of the major story arcs that happens over the course of the first two-thirds of the game. And for a while, I thought that this was the whole point of leaving her death in question, because they were trying to show that this grieving man still couldn't accept that she was really gone and was chasing ghosts, which I really liked once I thought that that's the direction they were going, and that they were going to resolve the plotline with Deacon accepting that Sarah had died, and perhaps speaking to somebody who buried her or saw her pass away in front of them. It would have been a moment of closure for both Deacon and the player, and I would have loved that. It all peaked in a moment where Deacon accepts her death and burns down the church that they were married in as a gesture of acceptance and a sign that he's moving on. And I really loved this moment. 
There's really cool shots and transitions between the past and the present. It really is beautiful, and I loved this. He burns it down, and it's a sign of him moving on. But the game doesn't commit to any real consequences, which is something that's going to come up multiple times throughout the game's narrative. Again, it's something that I love in a narrative, but I can totally understand why some people would hate it. If you look at La La Land, you see that these two characters have their own ambitions and things that they're looking for in life, and eventually they choose to pursue their own hopes and dreams as opposed to each other's, which means that they are fulfilled in their own hopes and desires and dreams, but they end up losing each other in the process. There's consequences to their actions. And fundamentally, it's a play on words that the movie is titled La La Land, because the idea that you can have everything and everything will end happily is just that. It's a delusion. It's La La Land. But while this may be the way that real life works, that doesn't mean that that's the way that our entertainment has to be. Which again is why I totally understand how some people might hate this while I love it. It's the same thing with Kahlua all over again. For another example of the game not committing to any real consequences because it's too scared to, look at Boozer and his arm. Boozer's arm steadily gets more and more infected to the point where eventually it needs to be amputated by a veterinarian because that's what happens in this world. Deacon helps them chop off his arm and I thought that they were setting it up for Boozer's death and for Deacon to be forced to reckon with whether or not surviving in this world is worth it now that he doesn't have anyone. A shift in the plot such as that would have seriously affected the way that Deacon looked at life and existence itself and the player would have been forced to reckon and meet Deacon halfway. It would have allowed for a ton of character arc and depth within Deacon itself but it would have been at the cost of Boozer as a character. But as with anything good, sacrifices must be made, and to me it seems as though, because Boozer is hardly used for the rest of the game, this was set up and could have been implemented quite easily. But at the last minute, they pull the rug out from under you, and it turns out that everything is happy-go-lucky and everybody lives happily ever after. Boozer even gets a knife for his arm prosthetic and eventually they put an ice cream scoop on it so that he can operate the truck towards the end of the game. And speaking of the end of the game, let's talk about that for a minute. At the very end of the game, Boozer drives the truck that's loaded with explosives into the fortress and he doesn't seem to jump out or do anything. And so when the explosion is massive and seems to destroy everyone and everything in sight, it's assumed by everyone, even the characters in the game, that Boozer didn't survive this. When I saw this, I thought that it was a little sudden and that they didn't set it up very well, but I was like, great, they're finally having consequences for all of these characters' actions. Deacon wants to save Sarah and some people must be sacrificed in order to achieve that goal. It could have led to some really interesting dialogue and scenes where these characters are forced to reckon with the reality that Deacon had to sacrifice what is effectively his brother in order to save his wife. And the fact that it was Boozer's choice could have also led to Deacon feeling relatively guilty because he felt as though he could have stopped him and could have prevented it had Deacon been allowed to drive the truck into the wall instead of Boozer. But again, at the last minute, the game bails on this and doesn't commit to its own consequence. Boozer just shows up, seemingly unscathed and fine, out of the rubble, and I guess he jumped out of the truck in time into the water and survived the massive concussive blast? I, I don't know. It just seems as though they bailed at the last second because they wanted to have a perfectly happy ending. Again, I hate this. And I find it to be really low stake and uninteresting writing because when nothing bad happens to the characters, they're never placed in a position where they need to grow and adapt. I mean, imagine if after the opening of The Last of Us, it turns out that Sarah, Joel's daughter, didn't actually die and survived. They just played that trick on you to make you sad and freak out during the opening credit sequence. The whole story would have a different context and Joel wouldn't be the same person because when she dies, he's forced to put up all sorts of walls and barriers to keep people from getting too close because deep down, he's afraid of losing another person he loves. So he'd prefer to just not love anyone again. I guess effectively I'm saying that I will only take the world as seriously as it takes itself. And that's not very seriously. Furthermore, it's not even very consistent. 
Let's look at a couple of examples early in the game that seem to set the tone for what the game is going to be moving forward. In the first 45 minutes of the game, you're slitting throats and seeing Boozer's arm get burnt by a blowtorch by a ton of crazy people. During this flashback, we see Deacon has to shoot a guy in the head just to survive, and he's freaked out because of it. It's very graphic and sudden and sharp and scary. It's a cutthroat world. In one of our first exposures to the game world, we see Leon, who's mortally injured, and begs you to kill him so that he's spared from the Freakers, who would rip him limb from limb, causing a terrible, terrible death. Deacon and Boozer decide to kill him, shooting him in the head, in order to spare him this gruesome, horrible fate. It's a tough moral decision, but it's one that Deacon has to make, and it sets up the world in a really interesting and cool way, where you see that these characters are being forced into difficult situations, but there still is a hint of humanity within them. They didn't need to spare Leon a horrible, terrible death, because from everything we know, he seems like he was a pretty bad guy, but instead they do, because at the end of the day, nobody deserves to be torn apart like the Freakers do. I loved this setup and I was really excited for the game that was ahead of me when I saw this. But they end up throwing all of this away with all of these coincidence explaining situations and no consequences being enacted. Seriously, everything just ends up being happy-go-lucky towards the end of the game because the game wants to have a happy ending and they decided that they weren't going to have any serious consequences in order to achieve that end. For the first few hours of the game, it's pretty consistent. The world is terrible, cutthroat, and requires you to do some pretty terrible things in order to survive. But later in the game, we're faced with things such as a veterinarian amputating Boozer's arm, after which he's fine in just a couple of days, even though it was already so infected that it had reached the bloodstream and was causing hallucinations and violent behavior. And I'm sorry, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm not convinced that simply chopping off his arm would fix all of this. Again, it's okay to have things that aren't realistic in your game or story, but if you do, don't be surprised when I don't take it seriously. For me, I think I was just frustrated because there's many moments, even later in the game, where Deacon is forced into a very difficult situation, but he still chooses to do what most people would probably consider to be the right thing. Two individual instances come to mind, and they both play on the same basic idea. At one point when Deacon is going through the Ripper camp, he finds a girl that's had her legs broken and is being left to the Freakers. It's a terrible punishment and a horrible way to die. You go over there, try to help her out, but when you realize that her legs are broken and there's no saving her, you decide to smother her in order to save her from this terrible fate. We gotta get a move up. Just do it. Hey, sweetheart. Sweetheart? It's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. It's fine. It's okay. It's okay. Shh. It's a moment that's very well acted and is haunting, to be quite honest. Another moment that was very well acted and one of my favorite scenes in the entire game just because of how raw it is, is when Taylor, he killed the camp doctor while he was stealing a bunch of drugs from the camp and went running off. Deacon receives a bounty for him and chases after him. Eventually he finds him and he's freaking out, he's very pathetic, he simply keeps repeating, I don't want to hang. Deacon knows that he's supposed to bring him back alive, and when he brings him back alive, he's going to go on trial, be abused in all sorts of ways, and then he's going to hang for his crimes. Now technically speaking, this is what's fair. Taylor did kill a man in cold blood in order to further his own self-interested gain. He stole a bunch of drugs, ran off like a coward, and he should hang for his crime according to the laws that he subjected himself to within the camp. But Taylor here is absolutely pathetic, and you really do feel for the guy. He doesn't want to hang. He understands he needs to pay for his crime with his life, but he doesn't want to do it by hanging. Now, some people would just say tough luck, and honestly, if I were given the prompt, I might have chosen that very option. But Deacon feels for the guy, and so instead executes him by injecting him with what's implied to be heroin in order to give him an immediate overdose. Taylor. It's Deacon St. John. How are we doing, Taylor?
that fucked up, man. I didn't mean to kill him, man. He wasn't supposed to be there. I... Doc was a good guy, man. He fucking, he fucking helped me. He helped me. Come on, get up. No. I don't want to hang, man. <laughs> I don't want to hang. I don't want to hang. I can't. Hey, listen to me, Taylor. Taylor. You kick and you kick Wait. and you shit yourself. All those fucks standing at attention. And they're laughing at you, man. They're laughing at you. I don't want to hang. I don't want to hang. Don't let them hang me. John, in here. Overdose. God damn it. Bring the body outside. And this is what I mean when I say that the game doesn't know what it wants to be. It has these moments where there are consequences to other characters' actions, but these consequences are only relegated to the B and C class of characters within the story. They rarely implement punishments and consequences to the main A list of the characters. I guess you could say that Boozer losing his arm is a consequence, but the whole thing was set up and to me it seems like in and of itself it's just a cop out to avoid killing him. And this is part of what I mean when I say that it's really difficult to put all of these thoughts into cogent sentences that actually make sense. Because on the one hand, I just want it to be consistent, I want the world to either be cutthroat or to not take itself too seriously, and to have a happy ending at the end of the day. When you try to balance both, it ends up being quite jarring, and you don't take situations very seriously. Towards the end of the game, I didn't feel as though the stakes were very high, because the game hadn't committed to any character dying or any bad thing happening to Deacon, Boozer, or Sarah, and so I knew that we were going to have a happy ending when all was said and done. I honestly thought that the writers might have been setting me up for a huge plot twist where they actually kill off Sarah at the very end of the game as a big middle finger to the player for thinking that they had figured out what was going on. And again, maybe I'm just cynical and a bad person, but I probably would have liked that more than the ending that we got, where everything just works out and everybody goes about their merry way. But with all that being said, I can totally understand why some people would love the way that it is written and prefer it over the tragedy style of writing that you see in a lot of these types of games and stories and the type of thing that I just expressed that I would support and enjoy. But all of this ties into the topic of character progression itself. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that nobody really grows in this story. Deacon eventually accepts Sarah's death, sure, but it turns out that she's still alive, so what's the point? And if you're saying, well, he still accepted her death, so he still made that progress mentally, I would say, okay, then why did we need her to end up being alive? They wanted her to be alive at the end of the story so that you could have everything work out happily ever after. Maybe I'm alone in this feeling, but when Sarah showed up and Deacon started running errands for her, it didn't feel as though Deacon was growing as a character. It felt like he had taken three steps forward and now was forced to take two steps back. As for Boozer, he's basically the same guy at the end of the story as he was at the start. The only difference is that he's, well, 
short an arm. Sarah is still very self-motivated as an individual and she feels a duty to society as opposed to herself or the ones that she loves. I found this interesting because you think that two years living in hell would make her feel as though it were okay to be self-interested and to look out for herself and those dear to her first. But no. Now one of the things I don't think many people have done, or at least the people that I've spoken to who have played Days Gone, is actually gone through the audio logs where you actually can hear Sarah discussing her thoughts about Deacon once he reappears. It gives you context on the story, it gives more explanations of quests, so for instance, the teensy tabby note, which is the note that explains why Sarah needs one particular toddler out of this massive horde of toddlers in order to perform an experiment on. It's actually quite touching, and I think it's a nice addition. Again, there's a lot of love that went into the story of Days Gone. They're just really bad at presenting it. Now, these notes do a pretty good job of expressing Sarah's mental state, because, of course, Deacon can't have large conversations where he picks apart her thought process during this portion of the game, thanks to her position and everything being, well, complicated. When you go through these notes, you can see that she's not completely convinced things can be the same. There's a weird tension when you first find Sarah, and I thought it was because she maybe had married somebody else, which again I thought was foreshadowed when Deacon saw the ring on another man, which might have implied that she had moved on, and it, again, bails at the last second instead of committing to something bad happening, almost like a castaway sort of situation where she was convinced he was dead and decided to move on with her life, all the while he was convinced that she was dead, but instead he refused to move on and held out hope. There's one note that's really touching when Sarah actually explains that she actually went to the barracks to see Deacon and to talk to him, but he was sleeping, and so she just left him alone. And she's right, things can't really be the same as they were before the outbreak now that she's in a high position within the camp and is responsible for trying to find a cure to this virus. In another note, she says that she wishes she could tell him how much things have changed after the outbreak. And again, I thought this was setting up some big shift where she expressed that she had found somebody new or married somebody new and things were different and couldn't be the same and she's moved on and now this has put her in a tough position. It, again, it's the classic castaway situation, but they bail at the last minute by saying that, well, it's basically that she's just feeling awkward because she hasn't lived with this guy for two years and she's not used to that anymore. It, it's, it's so low stakes. In the Cloverdale virus note, she says, maybe it can be like it was, and at this point, she shifts right back to the Sarah that she was before the outbreak, except she's able to shoot things and get violent now. whoop de doo Again, I really like these notes, and they can be very touching and give you a look at how these characters are thinking. But at the end of the day, the writers tend to just side with the trope that the character doesn't think things can be the same or doesn't know how to speak to the other person because it's difficult and there's so many emotions. And I just find it to be lazy, high school quality writing. These characters are thinking clear thoughts. They can express them clearly. A literature teacher of mine once read a short story I'd written and brought it back to me and said that I was suffering from a severe case of ambiguitis. I didn't really know what he was referring to, and he elaborated by basically saying that I was trying so hard to be covert and to not ham-fist my story down the reader's throat that I didn't end up explaining anything, and instead I just relied on the reader's imagination to fill in the blanks. It is a technique that some people love. Once again, it's like Kahlua. I just personally don't like it in video game form. As for Deacon and his character arc, he sort of grows by the end of the story, basically taking Iron Mike's spot after he's killed, but he hasn't been forced to change in any major way. He still does the same things that he does before, he's just in charge of people now. I guess you could say he does change in that he has a newfound lease on life, but that's because Sarah, who's from his past, has returned and Boozer's still alive, so he feels as though life is worth living because he has what he used to have. He hasn't grown, he's just reverted. One of the things I thought they were setting up for was that they were humanizing all of the Freakers after Sarah looks at them as people, and this is something that they talk about in multiple cutscenes, that Sarah looks at the Freakers as people, not as monsters, and Deacon 
is fascinated by this and says that's why she's special and that's why she needs to keep searching for a cure because she has a unique perspective on the world and i thought this was going to change the way that we played because all of a sudden deacon wouldn't be looking at these hordes as monsters but as people that used to walk around and talk just like him and Sarah. But nope, this is never developed. It could have been awesome, could have been really interesting for Deacon to feel really guilty about taking down all of these hordes, but instead they just move past it because after all, it's super fun to take on hordes. Now let's talk about coincidence for a second. It's very clear to me that the writers of Days Gone relied heavily on it in order to explain things away. Again, it's not inherently a crime to do this, and it is somewhat a matter of personal preference, but it's on a sliding scale, a spectrum if you will. A little is okay, a lot is lazy. What are some examples of coincidence in the story? Well, let's run through a quick list. Boozer. He jumped out at the perfect time where he wasn't killed by the explosion in the truck or by the concussive wave that blew by after. And he just walks out perfectly unscathed. Sarah's ring. This is shown right as you get to the new area on the southern part of the map. But what's the point? The only point of the ring being shown is that it gets your hopes up, maybe to think that this guy might be in a relationship with Sarah and to make you not trust him or dislike him, period. But the game still wants you to like him, and so, again, what's the point? Everything in a story should be very intentional, and there should be a reason behind each of these revelations, but instead it seems as though they just start showing you things in order to get your hopes up or to play with your emotions. Or look at the end of the game, when the colonel insists on having tea while he explains his motivation in a typical bad guy rant while he drinks poison tea. It's just, ugh. Or look at Sarah, the fact that she survived the outbreak, period. It's purely a result of her being ushered around from one camp to another, not because she's resourceful, because she's lucky and happened to have a certain number on her badge. Or look at Deacon running into O'Brien again. The odds of him running into the same young guy who was working for Nero during a zombie outbreak in the early stages of a post-apocalyptic world are very, very low. And again, it's not because O'Brien searched for Deacon or Deacon was searching for O'Brien individually, it's simply a matter of these characters being incredibly lucky. Or look at the leader of the Rippers. It's Jesse, who's actually an old member of Boozer and Deacon's gang and an old friend of theirs. Now they didn't need to do this. Seriously, what is the point of Jesse being the leader of the Rippers? They, they didn't need to do this. The whole point and the reason that they did it was because they needed the bad guy of the Rippers to want Deacon specifically so that they could have a bunch of backstabbing and betrayal in the story. It didn't need to be Jesse though. They could have just been pissed about the Rippers that you killed in the opening of the game when they were attacking Boozer's arm. Like he put out a bounty for Deacon and the bounty is more and more valuable the more Rippers that Deacon kills throughout the main campaign, eventually climaxing in the leader of the Rippers becoming so furious with how many of his people you've killed that he demands to have you traded in order for the peace treaty to be upheld. This is what I mean when I say they rely on coincidence. They didn't need to do any of these things. And honestly, they happen so frequently that it seems to me that this reliance was intentional and I honestly don't see any other way to explain it. It's like all the writers sat around a table and every time they threw out a coincidence that could tie into the story somehow, everybody said, ooh, that's really cool. And that was it. They didn't put any more thought into it. What if the leader of the Rippers is Jesse, an old member of their gang, so they know him and they humanize the Rippers? Yeah, that's cool. Sure. But once again, I can see how some people like this sort of kitschy style of writing. I just hate it. But even with this, the characters are all still pretty likable, probably due to the performances more than the dialogue. Sarah and Deacon are great, and there's even a few standout supporting performances as well, like the one I mentioned earlier with Taylor when Deacon decides to execute him there instead of allowing him to hang. The one character that I hate for sure though, and I'm just gonna say this because I, I can't stand her, is Tucker. Seriously, she is the worst. She's written poorly, her character's designed from the very beginning in terms of look and in terms of motivations, just seems confused, and most of her line delivery is cringy and boring. Seriously, she could be cut from the game and I think it would be way better for it, and I'm not joking about that. Speaking of cuts, 
Let's discuss scope for a moment. The game clearly can't manage itself. It's too big. If it were half the size, it would still be a 20 hour game and with a new game plus mode, it could deliver a polished 40 hour experience easy. Now this is easy to say, just cut the game. So I figured I would actually do that. What I would have done is I would have cut Copeland and Tucker entirely and instead started the game with Deacon and Boozer on the run. The same Ripper attack happens and Boozer hurts his arm and after his arm grows infected, he goes straight to Iron Mike's to receive extra medical help. After this, we learn of the Rippers and Iron Mike's feud and peace treaty and how it's breaking down. We help balance this while fighting off hordes occasionally to maintain camp safety. All this time, we're also having narrative flashbacks to our time with Sarah before the outbreak, but we don't give the player all of the signals that she's alive. Instead, we focus on the idea that Deacon needs to accept that she's gone and move on with his life. Eventually, everything breaks down and Deacon decides to take matters into his own hands after Iron Mike refuses to fight back against the Rippers. Deacon goes and performs the same flooding quest that happens in the game currently. Iron Mike is furious that you went behind his back and in turn kicks you out of the camp and demands that you go south and never come back, very similar to how he does in the main game. At this point we go into the southern area and the game continues as it does currently for the last 10 or so hours. Yes, we cut out a lot, but it would, in my opinion, result in a game that would be much easier to polish and balance. Furthermore, we could also get players late game gear earlier so that they can take on hordes sooner, which is after all the coolest thing that the game offers and it's something that you can only do fully and properly in the late game. Speaking of the gameplay, I really believe that the gameplay doesn't reach its full potential until you're around 25 to 30 hours in. Taking on hordes with small sawed off shotguns and pistols is pretty much impossible on the harder difficulty settings. And the entire game, this is all the player will really want to do. After all, that's what the game was advertised as offering first and foremost. Once I received the 50 caliber rifle and the napalm bombs, it felt like a totally different game in a very good way. Now, I don't think I'm alone in saying that the best part of Days Gone and the most fun part is when you're taking on a horde that's impossibly large and you still come out the other side victorious. It's a fantastic feeling, which is why that's what Ben Studios decided to showcase as their flagship feature back in E3. The problem is that you don't have the tools for this until around 20 hours in. Sure, you can take on hordes before that, but it's just not the same. Later, they provide you with many more tools, such as pipe bombs, remote detonated bombs, napalm, 50 caliber rifles, machine guns, ammo bags on the back of your bike that allow for full refills to be stored. All of these are straight up necessary if you're going to take on a larger horde like the one at the sawmill. Even on the easiest difficulty, you still need this higher quality gear in order to stand a chance. And I honestly don't know why the game shoots itself in the foot by withholding this from the player for so long. The game feels as though it has a 15 hour tutorial section, and I'm not kidding. Literally everyone I've spoken to who have played the game all the way through says the same thing. In my opinion, they take too long to give you the tools necessary to to do that which the game was advertised to do. The end of the game is awesome in terms of the tools you have and the fun that's yours for the taking. It just takes so damn long to show this to the player that I'm honestly left confused. I get holding your best cards close to your chest, but you still need to eventually play them. Otherwise, what's the point of having them in the first place? My fear is that a lot of people put the game down after 10 to 15 hours, as I was tempted to do because it didn't seem to have anything new to share, all while offering excessive tech technical issues. As a result, they would miss out on the game's best part, its end game. But I think this makes my point. If you've played the game, you'll know what I'm talking about. The game is too long and fails to properly pace the equipment that they provide to the player. But don't forget that Days Gone has some fantastic moments in terms of gameplay. The bike is clunky as hell at first, but actually turns into one of the best controlling and best feeling vehicles that I've played in a recent game. The ammo bags that you can put on the back of your bike are incredible and very useful towards the end of the game for taking on hordes. And I actually found myself being very careful with where I parked my bike before starting an encounter with enemies to make sure that I would have quick access to the ammo bags if I needed. These are the best kinds of upgrades in terms of gameplay when they change the way that you approach individual encounters in a good way. There's a lot of upgrades for the bike, not as many as I would have expected, but there's still a lot, and they do seem to make the bike faster, but 
traction seemed to be something that was overlooked and didn't have a huge impact on how the bike controlled. But maybe this was just me and I have a bad feel for it, I don't know. There are a ton of different weapons, but you don't gain access to even the majority of them until around 20 hours in. Now some people might hear that and say, well of course, the game should evenly pace all of the weapons throughout its entire campaign, and if that campaign is 35 hours long, so be it. And I might initially agree with you, but I think it's important to give players the tools necessary to take on the hordes, which are after all the main thing players are going to want to do in the game, as early as possible so that they can start engaging with the game's core gameplay loop sooner and sooner. Speaking of the hordes, they work super well and are responsible for the most fun that I had in the game, bar none. The crafting system works great and inspires heavy searching for materials on the harder difficulties. It's exactly the feeling I want to have in a zombie or freaker game. Especially using scrap to repair melee weapons, it actually inspired me to search every single vehicle that I encountered. It felt as though I were actually in a zombie apocalypse. I, I loved it. But all of this brings us to the last major topic, which is, of course, the technical issues. Now let's just dive right into it. Sony Bend is around 100 people, at least as of the time of the writing of this script. This makes them roughly comparable to Bethesda Game Studios as of around 2011, or in other words, the time when Skyrim came out. But don't worry, the comparison will end there. Now I first noticed how small this team was and everybody that was contracted and responsible for Days Gone when I was reading through the credits, and <laughs> oh, look at that, look at that. Daniel Radcliffe helped on this game. Oh, wish he could have used some magic on it. Now, to me, it seems as though the team is too small to make a game of this scope without serious QA shortcomings. This, of course, will take multiple forms. Now, as I stated earlier, these technical issues are on a spectrum. So I broke all of these into three broad categories based on their ability to pull you out of the game, fundamentally breaking the gameplay experience. The first level is fair, which means that you'll notice it, but it doesn't require you to change the way that you're playing or absorbing the game's content. It's just a little jarring. The second level is moderate. These will affect your gameplay. And the third level is game breaking. These are things that I would consider gameplay session ruiners, things that will pull you completely out of the game, remove any immersion that you may have had, and potentially even ruin the chapter of the game that you're in. Now, of course, all of these are somewhat subjective, but I'm just gonna show you all of them regardless, and you can make up your own mind. Now bear with me as I break down all of these issues that I encountered. You may think that this is unnecessary and excessive, but trust me, some people are in denial as to how broken this game can be. Even after I do this, people will still be in the comments claiming that the technical issues aren't that bad or are non-existent entirely. Starting from moderate and moving on to severe. This happened all throughout the game, but in this moment you can see that there's some weird ghosting on other bikers' tires. Again, not very important, doesn't pull you out of the game too much, it's just kind of weird. And in this moment, there's a weird throne glitch where we get thrown from the bike and after it resets, Boozer didn't actually respawn on the back of the bike, even though for the quest, he's supposed to be on it. And once we arrived at the gate, he hops off the back of the bike as if he were on it the whole time. It's just weird. This one's really small. Simply, he lays down on the bed the wrong way. Kind of stupid, but still there. This one, I'm not really sure what's happening. Here you can see a girl flying into the sky. I, I don't know what happens here. This one's funny. It's a dead body frozen in a running pose. Now for a few moderate glitches. You can see in this one, I actually rode past the checkpoint because I fell off of this cliff. And I actually had to turn back around and ride back through that section in order to get the cutscene to play, even though I immediately turn around and drive right through the same area that I just reached. It's weird, it's just a matter of no contingency being established. I had to go through this very particular area and window in order to trigger the cutscene. Small, but it does pull you out of it. In this moment, this machete drops all the way through the map and just disappears. Here, there's a bear walking that just despawns. In this moment, there's a ton of major pop-in during this cutscene. In this narrative sequence, we're walking in a midnight stroll that they keep referencing the fact that it's midnight, even though it looks like noon with clouds. Again, it's small, but it did pull me out of the cutscene and I misheard what she was saying multiple times because it was so clearly not night. I, I don't know what's going on here. Other night sections in the game when you're running through the open world feel as though it's actual nighttime. Here, I, it just doesn't. In this section, you can see that there's a massive frozen texture in the camp where you can't actually tell where the road is or what's going on. It eventually fixed itself, but it was very jarring when it happened. Some more low res textures. And for some severe ones, we can see here, 
I can't actually get on my bike to continue this quest. I thought I was going crazy here, but the prompts to actually interact with your bike don't appear, so you can't actually get on it. I ran all over the place. I tried running away from it, not looking at it so that it would despawn and then respawn. I tried going in to side the building and collecting other things, but all of the interaction buttons are just gone. You can't interact with anything. I even tried killing myself, restarting the previous checkpoint of the quest, and that didn't even work. It was still broken. I actually had to go and fully restart the game in order to fix this. I haven't seen anyone else who ran into this glitch, but if you did, please let me know in the comment section below. I'd like to see how common this was. Here you can see a crap ton of frame drops. This is something that happens all throughout the game and is very, very frustrating. Here we have two sets of audio overlapping at the same time. It's really weird. Another major frame drop and freeze. More frame drops. This glitch I don't actually have footage of because it was from my first playthrough, but at this moment when Sarah handed Deacon the I never stopped loving you note, this texture wasn't actually fully loaded in, so it just looked like three or four pixels that were incredibly blurry, so I couldn't actually read it. I completely missed this narrative moment because the tech wasn't keeping up with the cutscene. However, thankfully, in my second run when I got this clip, it actually loaded properly. In this section, I was taking on the sawmill horde. I had taken down pretty much everybody and I couldn't figure out where the rest of the horde was. There were still some people that I needed to take out. I just couldn't find them anywhere. Eventually, I realized that part of the horde had actually fallen down into the water and they couldn't get back up. So they were just clipped into this weird area. Luckily, I was able to take him out from the perch on the top of the cliff, but it did require me to run around for around five minutes, feeling like I was taking crazy pills before I found them. But to hammer all of this home, I wanted to make sure that you guys knew that I wasn't out searching for glitches and that I was simply noting down the things that were happening to me while I was playing through the game. And so my roommate, Michael, who was also playing through Days Gone around the same time that I was, volunteered to collect some of the glitches that he encountered during his run on his PS4 Pro while playing through the game. Now, obviously he doesn't record every second of his runs of a game because he's not a YouTuber, but I did show him how to use the PlayStation sharing feature in order to recapture moments that just happened to you while you played. So he collected the following series of glitches. This first one is actually kind of funny. The hostage is actually shot because Michael ran towards him with a baseball bat, but the animation doesn't stop. So she's just been shot in the head, but still acts like somebody's holding her up. It, it's just weird. In this one, there's just a bird floating in place, flying. I don't, I don't know what's happening here. It's like it's animation is playing, but it's stuck in the same spot. I don't know. In this one, Michael actually fell off of a cliff and the bike actually goes bouncing like a bouncy ball into the lake. And at this point it clips through the map and goes all the way down into the abyss. And so the only way to retrieve it is to go back to the mechanic and have the mechanics retrieve it, which needless to say, pulls you right out of whatever you were trying to do because the game happened to treat the bike like it was a bouncy ball and send it flying. This one's really weird. Basically, Michael was driving around a snowy area and then fast traveled to a non-snowy area, but the snow effect underneath the bike still is in effect, so it just looks like he has a smoke machine under the bike. It's not that important, but it still is a little weird. And this is the most serious one that he sent me, where an enemy actually clipped into the ceiling of a building. And initially I thought exactly what Michael thought, which is that the character was simply in a room upstairs and he just needed to find the stairs into that room. But no, he circled the entire building, went on the roof, everything, and couldn't figure out where this guy was until he realized that he was clipped into the ceiling of the building and there was no way of getting him. You couldn't shoot him, you couldn't do anything to him, even explosives didn't work. The only way to fix this was to reload the mission, at which point this character spawned on the roof of the building where he was supposed to. Now, I wish I could say that this was an exhaustive list of everything bad that happened to me and Michael during our runs of the game, but unfortunately, these are a very small representative sample of the things that you encounter all the time while you go throughout the game. All of these change the way that you play and not in a good way. But at the end of the day, this is a real testament to the quality of that diamond that's within this rough, the core of the game. 
I still had fun and enjoyed Days Gone despite all of these issues. That's pretty damn impressive. And I just wanna close by saying that I really am impressed with what Sony Bend was able to do here. For a small team, I think it's crazy to think that they put this behemoth together. And while I feel that there's parts of Days Gone that are great, I also feel that there's a lot of issues that Bend should have fixed before launching, and that the fact that the game was delayed so many times and still had all of these issues proves to me that the game was either too big to be polished by such a small team or the engine and code that they were working with was simply too broken to be fixed without making whole chunks of the game all over again. Or perhaps what's most likely the answer is that both of these were the case. But despite all of this, I enjoyed Days Gone, and I can't wait to see what a larger, more experienced team from Ben's studios will be able to bring to the table in the years to come. But that's all from me. Thank you for watching Honestly and Truly. This video took a lot of work to make, so if you enjoyed it, please like, leave your comments and thoughts down below. I would really appreciate it. And if you want to support me, either click the join button beneath this video to get exclusive early access to videos such as this, or support me on Patreon. If you have a game that you'd like to see critiqued next, please leave that down in the comment section below. At the end of the day, you guys still choose what games I cover. But that's all from me. Thank you for watching. I love you all, and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you.